In this tutorial we will learn how to create an instructional graphic using Adobe Photoshop Elements. Please make sure you've already watched most of the introductory tutorials available on Adobe TV and linked in Module 1 on our course website. The work sample we will build in this tutorial is designed to be used in a lesson about the July 4th Independence Holiday as an interactive graphic object in either a presentation or a website where students would have the opportunity to click on the star buttons to learn more about each subtopic. The specific image editing skills targeted in this module include importing graphic objects and other elements, compositing elements, filling elements with different colors simultaneously uh, to create gradient effects, using cookie cutter tools to extract portions of an integrated image and apply them in different layers, how to add special effects to individual layers, and how to modify the opacity settings. The first step in this process, of course, is to go ahead and launch the Adobe Photoshop editing application. And you'll note that there are two different options that are available. One is the editor and the other is the manager. And we want to be in the editor because we're going to create a new document. So after we get Adobe Photoshop Elements to load, we're going to go to the file menu and start a brand new blank file. And when Adobe Photoshop brings up the next dialog menu, you have some choices to make. And one of the most important things that we need to decide is how big we want this object to be, this graphic element to be. And so that will obviously be context dependent, but in our example here, we're going to make this graphic for a presentation that we plan to record at 1280 by 720, which is the lowest HD resolution and also the native resolution for most YouTube videos. So that's a good resolution to remember. We'll keep the actual pixel count at 72 uh, pixels per inch, uh, and we'll set these the width to 1280 and the height to 720 and click OK. That then draws an empty frame uh, in our workspace here. And I want to point out real quickly here this 50% zoom level. If you look at your keyboard and hit Control Plus, you can increase the zoom level up to 100%. Control Minus will bring it back down. Of course, to begin this, I need some actual content. I need some source material. So let's start off with a couple images that I'm going to grab from Google. So I'll switch over here and get a couple royalty free images that I found on Google. Right click and copy. And now it's on my clipboard. And when I switch back to Photoshop Elements, I, I could, if I wanted to, paste it directly in this workspace, but instead I'm going to create a brand new file, new image from clipboard. And there's a reason why we want to do this, and I'll explain it to you shortly, but notice that the zoom level may not be 100%, so keep that in mind. And I'll go back and get my other image now, just so you can see it one more time. Right click and copy, and then when I switch back to Photoshop Elements, workspace. Notice I've got different tabs up. Here is the document that I started, my brand new document. Here is the first source image that I brought in. And now I'm going to create another new source image, new image from clipboard. So now I've got three tabs up here. I've got the Declaration of Independence, that's source material. I've got the flag, that's source material. And then untitled number one, this is my actual project file. So why don't we go ahead at this point, save this. And I'm going to save this using the generic format uh, Photoshop.psd. And I'll call this simply July 4th. We'll talk a lot more about saving and exporting toward the end of this tutorial. OK, so I've got my three tabs up here. You can note that the name has now changed, July 4th. And then we've got untitled and untitled up here for our two source images. To start building this actual composition, I need to make sure my July 4th tab is active. So I'll click on that to make sure that it's available. I'll also take a note that I've got my first layer visible here by default. It's called Layer 1. And I'll eventually rename that. We'll come back to that in just a minute. But let's go ahead and bring some of this content in here that we just grabbed. They're up here in two different tabs, as you recall. But I want to get this flag into the July 4th work project. To do that is actually a little tricky. You have to make sure that you're, you have the correct tool selected. For example, if you look over here in my tool palette, I currently have the Move tool 
uh, selected when I really want to have the rectangular marquee tool. This allows me to then come back to the document and just drag out a selection rectangle. You can also hit Control A to select everything. It's still not copied to the clipboard, but at least you have selected. So again, make sure that you don't have the Move tool or any other tool selected. It needs to be on the Select tool. With that done, I can then go to the Edit menu and select Copy, just like you normally would. And then I can go to the Tab and switch back to my project file. And from here, I can hit uh, Edit Paste or Control V, and there's my image. Now what I need to do at this point, I need to switch my switch back to my move tool here so I can stretch this out. I want it to take up most of the document width here. Remember we have a width of about 1280 by 720. And I want to leave enough header and footer space for the other content. So I'm going to adjust that just a little bit upward, something like that. And you can uh, you can eyeball it, or you can actually measure it out at a at a pixel count. I'm going to go something like this right here. That looks good to me. And then I have to click this checkbox here. If you don't like it, you can click on the the red uh, de delete button, and it will restore it back to the original dimension. So I'll stretch that back out, and we'll go down one row, and go up one row, and now we're in business. So I'll click the green check mark. You might have noticed that Layer 1 still has that same name, but it now has an icon, a, a miniaturized version of the flag that I just put in there. So I want to go ahead and rename this file, and I can right-click that and rename. And I'm just going to type in here flag and hit OK. And that just keeps everything organized, because eventually we're going to have a whole stack of layers over here. Now, before I go get the image of the uh, Declaration of Independence, before I do that, I want to go ahead and create a background gradient color. And I want to base that gradient on the colors in this flag. So here's how we can do that. I'm going to go to this little pull down uh, menu and select new layer. And that new layer, drag it over here so you can see it, I'm going to call background. And it's currently empty. Since it's the background, it needs to be stacked on the bottom. So I'm going to drag it to the bottom. And now I simply want to fill it with some color. In order to do that, I need to select my gradient tool. And note that my if my tool options button is pressed here, the context sensitive or tool sensitive options become available right here. The current gradient colors are pulled from this color palette right here. We have a foreground color, which is currently black, and a background color, which is currently red. I've been messing around with this, but that's not what I want. I want a navy blue and a lighter blue to be my background color. Excuse me, a, a, a red to be to be my background color. So here's how we do that. Uh, I'm going to start off with the foreground color, and when I click that menu, it pops a a palette up here, a color picker, and I can choose from something here, or if I want to be more organic in my design, I can mouse over the image and you'll see it changes to an ink dropper and I can grab one of these cool blues. I'm going to get that blue there. You can see the new shade. I like that. So I'm going to select that. And then I'm going to switch to the background color and I'm going to choose one of these reds here. I get one of these deep reds. Uh, maybe a little deeper. There we go. And click OK. And now you can see the gradient when it's applied will look like this from dark blue to red. At this point, I can then go back to the image and notice that I have a little set of crosshairs here. It's probably hard to see that, but if you go to the very top and click and hold and drag a straight line down to the bottom, the magic of the gradient will appear. And depending on which direction, you'll either start with navy blue and end up with red or vice versa. In this case, it's doing exactly what I wanted to do. And to get a better understanding of how this works, if I go up to my flag layer and select it, nothing changes in the document, but if I click on the eyeball, I can make it temporarily be hidden. And now you can see the gradient color uh, assigned to that background uh, layer. Click on the eyeball and it comes back up. Now I want to go back and get that image of the Declaration of Independence. So I'll click on the tab, Untitled 3 in my case here, and there it is. Now before I put it in there, I need to have a pretty good understanding of how high that image needs to be. So let me switch back to July 4th here. For example, we know that in the master document that we're trying to emulate here, the flag 
and the painting are blended. That is, there's some opacity that is reduced between them so that they each shine through each other having this composite effect. It's really cool. In order for that to work well, we need the image of the flag and the image of the in Declaration of Independence to be completely identical in height. So to guide us, let's go ahead and go to the Window menu and select Info. That will bring up the Info panel here, which then allows me to go back over to the Tool Palette and switch tools to the selection marquee and now I can come in here with this nice set of crosshairs and I can mouse over the very top of the flag down to the very bottom of the flag and it will mag magnetically snap to it and if you look in the info panel I can see that for my image currently I'm at 416 pixels in height. I already know what the the width is. The width is 1280 because we set that as one of the document uh, preferences but 416 pixels in height is really good for me to know. Why? Because it will now allow me to switch over to the Declaration of Independence image and if I position this strategically here I can come down here and grab my crop tool and you know what crop tools do from what we've studied previously I can drag a selection lasso around most of the image and I can look at what my height is down here by default it's 513 and I can reduce that a little bit if I want to, maybe take out some of the f feet here. And I know later I'm gonna, I want a little bit of head space because I want to use the images of these heads as one of those buttons. So I'm going to grab it and set it to about 416. So I'll just keep dragging it, dragging it around until I get it uh, as close as I can. It doesn't have to be precise because you can uh, you can resize it to fit. For example, I'll, I'll leave it at 459. It just needs to be close. And when you've got it selected correctly, go ahead and, and click the green checkbox. It then crops that out and now you're ready to select. So go back to your selection marquee, drag a lasso around that, go to the edit menu and hit copy or just hit control C for copy. Switch back to your July 4th object now and paste that on top of uh, the flag and remember it was a little bit taller than what we used we don't need this anymore and by the way if your if your dimensions aren't set by default to pixels you can change that in panel options so keep that in mind click on panel options and uh, you can go ahead and change that from inches sometimes that's the default and you can change that to pixels anyway so I've pasted the declaration painting in here and it's currently underneath the flag if I want to put it on top of the flag, which I do, I go ahead and put it up there. If I switch back to my move tool now, now I can go ahead and get these dimensions right. I'm going to see how it snaps to the top of that flag. If I then grab the bottom handle, I can move it around and as I get close to the edge of that flag, watch what happens. Bam! Do you see it magnetically snap to that? It also allows me, and this is really cool, because I select, I crop the image, I can actually move it around a little bit until I get just the right people in frame that I want. So that's another real slick advantage of cropping out a, a limited amount of the, of the source material that you want to use. All right, so now we're looking good. I can click out here in space, or excuse me, I have to click on the green check mark to finalize that positioning. But now the flag and the painting are exactly on top of each other which allows me to do some really cool stuff. For example I can come up here to the layers palette and I can make sure my painting layer is selected and I'll tell you what let's go ahead and change that name while we're at it let's call it painting and with that layer selected I can now go to its opacity value and reduce it down to say oh I don't know let's try 50 percent see what we've got here. We want to be able to see both images roughly equal. So let's start off with 50% and that looks that looks pretty decent. The selection uh, rectangle is around. If you deselect out here in space you can see a better preview of this and that looks pretty good. It's obviously a, a flag themed image and it's obviously some type of formal historical event and anybody with half a brain is going to recognize this as uh, a July 4th signing even without the text objects that we're going to put in here. So with that said with our opacity setting at 50% and notice that we only have to do it on one if you set 50% to both of them then they then they both kind of wash out so you only need to do it to whichever one is on top. Now next step of course let's put those interactive 
buttons in here. If you remember down here on the bottom between the flag between the image and the red background down here, I wanted to put three buttons. And these buttons would be in my head interactive in the final document that I'm making. As you recall, this image is only the beginning. This is the graphic object that we're going to insert into our PowerPoint presentation, into our keynote presentation, into a website we're developing, or maybe it's an app or who knows what it is that we're making but it needs to have interactive properties and so I want three buttons here and I want those buttons to have a particular shape hence the cookie cutter tool take a look over here in the bottom left hand side this is a really really neat tool and I want to use it to create three different buttons so here we go now we have to go back to the source material to to use this cookie cutter and here's the reason why I'm going to start off with the left hand button and the left hand button uh, is going to identify the people some of the people that were signing this particular document so in this case if I go back to my tab for the painting I'll, I'll, if you recall I cropped this down to a much smaller uh, amount of content than what was originally displayed if I want to rev revert backwards, all I have to do is hit the escape key to take my selection marquee off if it's still there, and then hit control Z to return. I might have to do it a couple times to return to the uncropped version of this. And this is really important. And this is one of the reasons we wanted to keep the source material up in a separate tab, because it now allows me to come back here and grab this cookie cutter tool and I have a, a wide variety of shapes that I can use uh, and there's a pull down menu here there are lots of different shapes that you can use obviously it's a very popular functionality but I'm going to choose this uh, star cut out here and with that selected I can now go into the actual document and drag a star big enough to get those three faces something like that and as soon as I release the mouse you'll note that it crops out everything else except for that. That looks good to me, so I'm going to select the checkbox uh, as in OK. Then I'm going to hit Control All or uh, I can use the selection marquee again and then go to my edit menu and copy it. In other words, all I've done is just crop it out in this particular shape just like we did before, but it's now, now it's in a star shape instead of a rectangle. And then I'm going to go back to my source image or excuse me, my, my project and hit control V or edit paste to put the actual star in here. I'll choose my move tool and then I can drag it around and put it into position. And I'm going to do this for the other three objects as well. So I'm going to skip ahead now and do the same thing for two more two more buttons. So I have all three of these lined up. Once you've gone back and created the cookie versions of three different parts of this image that we want to use uh, as buttons. For example, I got one star cookie, I have one cookie of the papers that are actually being signed, and then one cookie of the uh, in some of the individuals that are, that are actually signing it. You probably have noticed that your stars may not be the exact same dimension and it's really easy to fix this and I want to show you how to do it for example my flag star over here is much bigger than the other two stars because I was just kind of eyeballing dragging and dropping the cookie cutter tool and I do that deliberately because I know that once I get back here I can simply layer it on top of each other and then use the fill handles here to get it to snap back to the exact width and the exact height that it needs to be and when I click the checkbox now it's a perfect match for what we had. So I'll slide it over here and try to get it equidistant so we have consistent repeated gutters uh, between each one of these uh, different objects. And now we're in good shape and we're ready to add some style to these. For example, by default down here the layers button has been selected and so in the right hand panel in my workspace here I only have layers presented. I, I may want to go ahead and choose uh, the effects button here and bring that up to assign some options to each one of these buttons here. I've got the star set up first and I'm going to give it a bevel effect. I'll give it a drop shadow shadow too, but I'm going to go ahead and switch to bevels and I'm going to choose this simple inner bevel here. And if I double click on it, you'll see that the star suddenly assumes that bevel. And that may be good enough for you. A drop shadow is pretty common to make elements punch out on screen. So I'm going to choose this second 
uh, drop shadow effect and you can see the immediate change here uh, on the star. Now I'm going to skip ahead and do it for the other two objects as well to save a little bit of time. Once I've assigned the bevel and the drop shadow to each one of my stars I can go back to the layers palette here and click on that to reactivate the layers. It's probably not a bad idea at this time to go ahead and rename my layers because as soon as we put some text on here the, the layer palette's going to get a little cluttered. So let's go over to the first star here and if I double click it you'll see that it activates the appropriate layer. Uh, it's currently on the bottom because that's the, the first star that I put in here. And I'm going to rename this either by double clicking or right clicking and hitting rename. And we're going to call this signatures because we want to know who signed the Declaration of Independence. And for the second layer, uh, for this one, this will simply be the text. In other words, this will be a link that will go to the full text version of the Declaration of Independence. And then for layer three, which is the flag, we're simply going to call this flag. Take a look now at how the 3D effect here for these three buttons really makes them pop off the background graphics. You might also note that the color distinction here between the bottom red in my footer and the white and red in the flag is a little muddy, as is the difference in the, the bluish purple color in the header and the other colors in the flag and the painting immediately below it. In situations like this where you have a weak or undefined contrast area and you want to make the primary subject of the of the graphic pop, in addition to doing 3D, because you can't do everything in 3D, you can also use very strategically positioned horizontal lines that will allow you to create focal points in the graphic. This is what I mean. Watch this. I'm going to choose my line tool here and I'm going to select uh, the make sure the white color is selected and even if it's not I can I can do that afterwards actually I'll show you that and I'm going to take my mouse and position it right here on the top corner of that graphic and then here's the trick hold down the shift key and click drag across and that'll make you draw a straight line instead of trying to have to freehand it and I'll go all the way across and when I release I have this nice colored line that's set up there and if I don't like the color of it I can go to this pull down menu remember the tool options here are context sensitive and I'll select this white color here uh, to assign that to that particular value and then if I come up here and, and deselect anywhere I'll then see the full color and you can see we've got a nice distinguished line right above that and it, it when I create the second line down below it it's going to create a really cool, have a really cool focal effect. So watch this. I'm going to grab the line tool again, go down to the bottom of that composite graphic, make sure my cursor is lined up pro appropriately, and I'll drag it all the way across and release. Now that certainly may look acceptable, but in some cases it might look better if we have a dark line down on the bottom to create the illusion of lighting. So imagine this white line here uh, being black instead of white. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that or I can just actually I'll just undo it control Z and it disappears and then I'll go back here and double click on my line tool to get another line tool and we'll drag across here but before I do that I'm gonna switch my color to black here on this context sensitive tool options panel make sure that this is set to black and then let's go ahead and draw a line going across to create that second shape and you may not notice it until you click your your uh, move tool and then deselect and then you can see you've got a white line up here and a dark line down below and obviously we have some depth problems you can see that the stars are now covered up by partially by this line so obviously we need to fix that and that's very very simple to do up here are our two layers you'll note that the the first line shape one is the top one so let's go ahead and call that white line white line and let's go ahead and call the bottom one we'll call it a black line in desktop publishing we sometimes call those rules horizontal rules a black rule and a white rule in this case though we want to, the black line to be below the stars 
So the, the three stars are flag, text, and signatures. So those are the layer names. So if I simply drag slowly until my insertion point is right in between painting and signatures, the line should now go on top of the painting, but beneath the stars. So we've sandwiched it underneath the stars. And how about that? Now that looks really, really cool. We've got this great focal point in the middle of the image. What's next? Well, let's put some text into this. First step, let's get these buttons labeled down below. So I'm going to go grab my text tool here. And you can choose whatever font you want. There are plenty of different pull down options available. And you can bold, italicize, and underline, and change the point value. I know the 30 point is going to be too high. So let me try something like 18. We'll start off with that. And I'll then get a cursor, and I'll click right about here. And uh, whoops, I need to make sure my color is correct. Do I want black text on a red background? No, that's probably too too dark. Let's switch to just a light color. I'm going to go to white and click back up here and let's type signatures. And that looks pretty good, but I think I may want to change it some. So, I'll tell you what, I'll zoom in here some so you can see. I'll control plus and then scroll down a little bit. And now, if I double click inside there, I get the insertion window, and now I can come in here and play around with this just a little bit. Let's try 24 and make that bold. And that looks pretty good. So I'm going to hit check there, and I'm going to move it over, and that looks absolutely fantastic. Now, after you've gone through and assigned a style to this, the quickest way to duplicate it for the other three is to copy and paste and then go back and change it. I'll do the first one, and then you can do the other one on your own. However, we're not going to copy and paste the actual text. We have to copy and paste the layer. And this is a, this is a good trick to see. I'm going to go back over here and see where it says signatures. This is my layer. These are my layers. I'm going to right click signatures and select duplicate layer. And the duplicate layer submenu pops up. I can click OK. I can give it a different name, or you can just click OK and watch what happens. I've now got two signature text layers right on top of each other. So I'm going to drag this over, try and keep it in the same line right there. And I'll, of course, want to change the text. And in this case, the text that I want to use is actually the word text. So I just double click and type in text, check it off, and now I can position it. Let me move it over some. And there we go. Notice that the name automatically changed from signatures copy to text. All right, so we'll do it one more time to get another layer here. And this is for the flag. And I could call it flag here if I wanted to. F, F L A G. OK. And now I can simply drag it into position. And if I double click inside it, I can then change the text to flag. So now I have all three text objects. I'm going to click outside it to deselect. And I'll zoom out, Control minus, Control minus. And now you can see I've got three text objects near their stars. In the crap principles, the rule of proximity says I need to put my objects near each other. So I'm going to slide them up a little bit. You might note that our text looks a little plain as is. And that may be acceptable, given that the stars are the real three-dimensional elements that pop off the page. But if it bothers you, and I have to admit that sometimes I like the text to have a little bit more emphasis. So in that case, what I'll do, I'll come in here, I'll go back to my Layers tab here, and I'll switch over to the Signatures layer. And I want to assign an effect to it. Just make it real simple. I'll click on the Effects tab down here and give it a drop shadow. And when I deselect down here, you can see that it makes it gives it a little bit more emphasis. I'll do the same thing uh, for text and then for flag as well. So I'll do all three of these and skip ahead. Of course, the, the star buttons aren't the only place we have text on this uh, particular graphic. We also have it up in the header. So let's go ahead and make our most important text object, which is uh, the July 4th phrase that needs to go up here. So I'll grab my text tool. And I'm going to set my font size to 100 point. I think that will be about right. And I'll click somewhere over here. And I'll type in July 4th. 
and that looks pretty good to me. I'll click the checkbox. You can always go back and and be a little bit more precise with this, but that's the first of three text objects. I then need to put a text object for 1776 and a text object for Independence Day. And so I'm going to go ahead and do that right now and skip ahead. After I create all three objects, you'll note that I went ahead and changed some styling as well, and this is to manipulate the emphasis, the level of dominance of some of these text elements. And then this is deliberate. For example, it's no surprise that July 4th is the most dominant element on the on the graphic. It should be because that's the whole reason uh, for the holiday. It's date based. The year obviously is important as well and that's why I left it in uh, the light white colored uh, font. But I grayed out Independence Day uh, even though we all know that this was the day of our country's independence. We know it more closely as the July 4th holiday. So by changing the font color of Independence Day what I end up doing is reducing its emphasis on the page so that the two dominant elements here are July 4th, 1776 and of course the buttons down here. So while we're at it, why don't we just go ahead and do a, a full complete crap analysis here. Let's take a look at this. Make sure we've, we've designed this graphic consistent with what Williams says we should do in, the, in her crap principles. Contrast, of course. Do we have good contrast? Do these text elements stand out from their background colors? Yes, they do. Do these buttons stand out from their background graphics? Yes, they do. Do these text elements right here stand out from the background red? Well, they, they're good from the red, but I might consider boosting their size just a little bit or maybe adding a little bit of bold to that to make these just a little bit bigger to improve their contrast. How about repetition? Do you see any repetition being used in this graphic? Of course you do. It's the organic color scheme. We took the stars and stripes, the blue and the red, and we made that our background colors. We used white for key emphasis colors, so we are repeating these colors organically throughout the piece. We're also repeating some of the graphics. In these star buttons here, we've taken bits and pieces using our cookie cutter tool from other elements on the page. So this kind of repetition adds what we call or what designers call document unity. Alignment. Do we have good alignments of all these different elements? Absolutely. Take a look at the line here for July 4th and 1776. They both share the same horizontal uh, horizontal alignment. Same with the vertical alignment between Independence Day and 1776. These three stars are all in line. And of course the principle of proximity we already talked about. The text is close to the stars. What does that do? And these stars are close to each other. What does that do? Well, it effectively creates one group here and one group at the top. So when we scan the page just looking at it, we really see only three things. We see the title text headers, we see the buttons, and then we see the middle graphic, the opacity flag bleeding through the painting of the declaration signing. So we pass the crap principles. Yes. Good good job for us yay team okay what's the very last thing that we then have to do well of course we need to save the file we've been saving it all along or at least I have I've been hitting control s um, but if we if we look at the options under save as I want to point out a couple things the default file type is Photoshop document PSD and this is a great file type if you know that you're going to repurpose this document later make some changes to it etc you can think of it as a project file Many print shops, if this is destined for the printer, this graphic that you're creating, then many print shops take Photoshop documents natively, so that's a great file format to use. However, there are others. Uh, TIFF, for example, this is a really good cross-platform file format that still preserves independent layers so that you could use them in other in other programs or if you wanted to share this file with somebody who didn't have Photoshop but had another editor many of them can uh, open up TIFFs and have those layers preserved. JPEG of course you know what that is that's a really important file format for anything that goes on the web in fact since we're using this in a presentation we're gonna save this as a JPEG but one of the best things about Photoshop Elements is that they have a designated save for web uh, output filter here and even though we're going to use it in a presentation file I like to save my JPEGs using the save for web dialog function because it'll it gives us all different kinds of options here and these options include setting the level of compression uh, which in most cases means the level of quality back in the old days when we were using uh, analog modems and we had very low bit rates we'd have to 
we could, if we wanted to, choose very high compression or very low or medium compression settings, and that would reduce the file size. But these days, we don't need to worry about that. Let's maximize our quality here, and you can see the image size. The original is 3.5 megs, and we've reduced it down to 559K, which is certainly acceptable. If I switch it to very high, you can see it drops almost in half to 268K. So I'll leave it there for now. And if you really want to get anal about it, especially if you have lots of photos in there, you can play with the slider here. But typically, the very high setting is is a real good default locate or default setting to use for outputting JPEGs. So when I click Save, it then gives me a dialog window, and I can go ahead and save this uh, to my. I'll just save it on my desktop here. I can then open it up in an image viewing application, so I can preview it uh, at 100% size full resolution and it looks great it's now ready to be imported into whatever my instructional instructional authoring platform might be for this particular learning object for example it might go straight into a powerpoint about the july fourth holiday it could go into a movie a movie timeline uh, in a video editor for integration in some instructional video that you're developing it could go into a website or whatever your final destination learning object may be this graphic, this JPEG that you just produced using Photoshop Elements is ready to rock. So good job. This concludes the tutorial for using Adobe Photoshop Elements to create an instructional graphic.